Recording in progress. Sorry. <laughs> Cinnamon, episode 92. We are well on the road to 100 episodes. 100. Yes, uh, there's going to be confetti, fireworks, maybe the fireworks turn into a dragon and sweep over the Shire. We don't know how this thing is going to go down, but it's going to be a great episode. Douglas, how are you? Uh, I'm doing all right. And every time we record and every time I make that same stupid joke by doing that high pitch thing, all I want to do is watch Bunraku. Uh, <laughs> that's all I want to do, because all I can think of is red suits. <laughs> so I may have to find some free time and put that on. There you go. Anyway, you go. Uh, I'm I'm doing good. How about you? Uh, not too bad. Not too bad. We have in our midst a guest with us today, man. We have Mr. Michael Scott joining us, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for thanks for inviting me. I was actually just chuckling, Douglas, when you said all you want to do is watch Bunraku, because I was just thinking how much Daryl sounds like Mike Patton doing his narration in that movie. So you guys really do have a Bunraku thing going on. Happy birthday, fucker. Dude, oh, <laughs> I know, love that movie. It's been a while since I watched that movie, man. It might be Love that movie. The Bunraku Watch yes. Through podcast coming. Uh Ugh. three of us next year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just go through all of the killers. That's just, I mean, it'll take 10 episodes, but like, wait, 20, 10, 20. I don't know. It sounds like a good reason to uh, revisit it because I can't remember how many killers there are. Any reason is a good reason. Uh, but uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, get, do a do a quick little intro here. Uh, Mike Scott is one third of the incredible podcast Action for Everyone, A4E, which is uh, co-hosted, I would say, by... The director, uh, Liam O'Donnell of the uh, Sky Skyline series. My brain went Skylance for some reason. Don't don't even ask me. But of the Skyline series, and then of course one of my favorite follows on Twitter, Vice, because I think the peak moment where I went, I need to follow this guy is when he said, "Film critics need to settle their differences, their difference of opinion, by fist fight." Mm -hmm. And so many disagreements would settle. And at which point I went, well, when that happens, uh, that's when I quit this business. Because uh, <laughs> I've seen photos of Vice and he looks like the uh, the uh, Bowler King. So, uh, <laughs> no, no. But uh, when with Action for Everyone, you guys have been doing that podcast for a while. What what was the the start of that? What was the start of that for you guys? Um, so, uh, the start of it was, you know, it had its roots in my first podcast, Adkins Undisputed, uh, where I was going through the, uh, the filmography of my favorite actor, Scott Adkins, and I was going movie by movie and I had guests and Scott was coming on. And as part of that, I, uh, hooked up with Liam. I brought Liam on for a guest episode when Skylines was coming out. Uh, because Liam had been active on Twitter and and I'd gotten to know him. And, and so I brought him on and we got to know each other at that point. And uh, I had had Vice on a couple of times as well. And so two years ago in uh, September, uh, almost exactly two years ago, Liam dropped a DM to both of us and said, hey, I, I think it would be fun to do a podcast with you guys where we highlight direct-to-video stuff and, and stuff like that. And we were both like, all right, well, if this crazy director wants to hang out with us for a week and, <laughs> you know, once a week, that's fine. So, uh, so that's, so, and at that point, Adkins Undisputed had kind of been on a bit of a hiatus anyway, because I just got burned out. I was putting those episodes, the amount of research and work I was putting into those episodes, I just got burned out. And this is a much more loose, you know, we, no prep work. We just get out there every week and wing it. And, and so it's much easier to do. <laughs> Best kind um, of show. Yeah. And, and honestly, I like that we can, we've got a broader range of stuff to talk about. That was the other thing, as much as I loved doing Adkins Undisputed, and I am going to go back to it at some point. Um, I was starting to feel really stifled. Uh, you know, I, I was trying to find ways to sort of backdoor talking about other movies, just mm -hmm. because I was starting to feel really stifled doing this very niche, very narrow uh, podcast. And now it's much, much easier. I can kind of talk about whatever I want, but I can do it for like 10 minutes or an hour. Uh, and I like that freedom. It, it helps to not have to like focus on one thing for an hour and a half. One of the things that I love about y'all show, particularly because of the focus on direct to, to video is that at least for me growing up, the idea of direct to video was, was this 
horrible thing. It was like, we're just going to push your thing out. We're not going to talk about it. But there are a lot of movies that come out. Yeah, they might be direct to video, but that doesn't speak to the quality of the storytelling of the acting or the ideas. It it was astonishing to me to find out that, for example, John Wick was supposed to be direct to video and Lionsgate bought and went, we think there's something here. And what a hell of a thing that it's been, speaking of Scott Atkins. But um, uh, is, is that something that you guys try to do is sort of look for those gems? How do you decide what to talk about? Or has it just been, here's what we've watched recently? Um, we typically we typically kind of look at what's coming out. Um, I'm sort of the I'm the guy that's in the D, the DTV trenches. So every week I basically go through Vudu and Amazon Prime and I look at what's come out. I also, you know, I, I read a lot about these movies that are coming out. Uh, shout out to Lee Golden's Film Combat Syndicate. That is a great resource for people that want to know uh, DTV stuff that's coming out. Um, and so I try and keep my finger on the pulse of that. And basically I go through and I go, this looks good. This looks bad. And <laughs> uh, and then I, I pay my money to Voodoo. And uh, and I am about one out of five times very, very happy. And about <laughs> one out of five times very, very upset. And the rest of the time, I'm just kind of there, you know. Um, so and then we try and make sure if there's a big action movie, at least, you know, coming to theaters, at least one of us goes to go see it. That's usually Vice. Uh, and then Liam is usually the one because he's got four kids and he's the one that actually is trying to get movies off the ground. He's the one that kind of brings up sort of the reevaluation of some stuff. You know, Vice and I will see something and then six months later, Liam will see it and it gives us a really nice chance to sort of revisit it and come back to it. And then if you guys have listened at all, you also know that Liam kind of gets a little obsessive about movies. So he will you know, only talk about water world for like a month and he'll only talk about avatar for like a month and stuff like that. So um, <laughs> it, it's, it's not really that planned out, except I do try and make sure that we always have something to talk about every week. And, uh -huh. and I imagine at least seeing the online conversations, I imagine the personalities that y'all bring to the table have no issue with, if you need to come up with something, filling that time as it were <laughs> especially not now especially not after doing this for two years you know i think october 11th is our two-year anniversary so at this point we just we can just sit and and shoot the shit about whatever uh i mean yeah if there's one random thing we can like go off on it for 45 minutes and you know and it's also helped too because we started getting a lot more guests you know and, and we're trying to highlight below the line people so we're getting stunt coordinators and people like that on uh and that those are always really enlightening and illuminating and and just fun conversations for us because we learn so much from all these people about how to you know how these movies are made and stuff like that just out of curiosity where did this start for you and when i say this i mean your appreciation for for cinema in general not you you obviously cleared the the podcast part yeah uh, but like where did this begin for you my whole life my earliest memory is seeing star wars at the drive-in when i was two uh so movies have been part of my life my entire life and uh Action movies have, for whatever reason, those were always the movies I gravitated to as a kid. Even, Hell yeah. <laughs> even you know, like animated stuff, it was always the Disney. Like if it was a Disney movie, it was the Black Cauldron that I that I that I loved, you know. And and obviously GI Joe and Transformers and stuff like that. Growing up in the eighties, so I've just I've always been an action kid. I I've tried to be a horror kid. I've tried to do other stuff, and I like all those other genres. But I've just I've always been an action kid uh, my whole life. There, there's quite literally nothing wrong with that, and the fact that it sounds like you don't stick to one medium. When it comes to that, it's got to help keep it entertaining, because if you are open to, say, an animation versus a live action, it there's there's a lot out there. And I don't oh, think yeah. people realize that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, there is, you know, I used to I used to complain a lot about the the quality of of action in animation. And now in this day and age, in 2023, there are some animated action movies out there that are just mind blowing in in the ways in which they're actually using proper choreography and and stuff like that now 
to to do these animated action scenes. Um, and, and so it's a really interesting sort of avenue. And I'm the same with comics. You know, there's I, I, I look for the action stuff in comics. How how is the the you know, the the geometry of the fights, the geometry of the bodies in motion. How is this stuff all drawn? Uh, it, and so, yeah, I'm constantly, you're right. It's I'm, I'm medium agnostic when it comes to action. <laughs> <laughs> Which is uh, frankly, at least it, from my view, a great place to be. It always frustrates me when, when I hear someone say that there's not enough of a certain type of movie or, or, or a certain type of narrative or whatever else. And I'm going, where are you looking? Because if you're just going, for example, to the movie theater, or if you're just looking for what the major studios are releasing, you may realize or discover there's way more out there, which is one of the reasons why a lot of the direct to TV stuff or even some of the stuff that's being released by uh, uh, some of the major physical media boutiques lately have been releasing things that never got play in the U.S. or didn't get major play that now can be refound. Shout out to Wellgo. What was that? Shout out to Wellgo. Oh, hell yeah. Wellgo. Okay. Uh, I'm going to nerd out for just Action. a second. Yeah. For just a second. I came uh, over the weekend. I forget the full title of this movie. So I'm going to look up its website. It comes to theaters on the 20th and then more theaters on the 22nd of September. It's getting an IMAX screening. And I am so stoked, but at the same time ticked off because I am busy and so i can't make it happen it's creation of the gods one kingdom of storms i watched this trailer and i went i i i think that's the nine-tailed fox i think that's neza i think and i started listing these characters that i literally only know because welgo has been releasing these animated films that are these big gigantic feature films uh, the White Snake, Green Snake. Uh, some of these you can find on Netflix US streaming, if I remember right. But this film, Creation of the Gods, one is live action. It's the first of a trilogy, and it is that universe, this Chinese uh, story, the um, Invectature of the Gods, I think is what it's called in the English translation. It's this massive story, and I'm going, yes. <laughs> and I'm so pissed that I'm going to have to watch it at home when it hits home video simply because I bet this would be incredible in theaters. But this is going to be an action epic in like capital E. <laughs> Check this out. I will maybe I'll go to the theaters in your stead, sir. Please. Give me a please report back. And um, I don't think, Daryl, by the way, that you'll need to do homework first to go see this. I figure this is going to be sort of your introduction to those characters. But if you need but if you need some background, kind of like you foisted upon me with Neon Genesis, Thrice Upon a Time, I mm -hmm. just finished episode mm -hmm. 17 before we started this. I've got 18 to go and then like 58 movies before Thrice gets released in its home video thing. Yes. I'm working on it, but I can lend you a whole bunch of the home releases well goes released so that you can find out who Neza is Hell and the yeah. Nine-Tailed Fox and the Green Snake and the White Snake. But anyway, I'm going to shut up now. Where were we? <laughs> Action movies. Uh, <laughs> Michael, it's 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 interesting to have you on at this time because I'm currently in the final stages of compiling my 100 action movie list uh, ranked from one to 100. And I'm getting down to that like kill your darlings phase yep. of my list. Yep. It's like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you realize just how much over the decades has come out and I, and I got stuff going back to the I think all the way back to the maybe uh, 50s there might be one in there somewhere uh but yeah it's just so much good stuff out there that it's I'm I'm sad to see you go gunpowder milkshake as silly and ridiculous <laughs> as you are uh it, it, it's been a uh, an interesting process going through and filling in a whole lot of blind spots on movies I had never fully seen con air so I was able to knock that off the list. Yeah, you can't see everything, right? Uh, so yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a put it down if the bunny gets it. <laughs> Got the whole world in his hand. Sorry, I freaking love Conair. It, it is apparent that you do. <laughs> yeah, there's there's movies that um, there's movies that even I you know that people are always surprised that I haven't seen because, like you said, you can't see everything. I mm -hmm, mean, I. Yeah. 
I look at some of these folks online who are sort of in action Twitter and the amount of movies that they're able to watch. I'm I'm in awe. I'm like, there's no way I could ever watch this many movies. Um, yeah. And I watch a lot of movies, you know, <laughs> but there's just no way I can watch that many. So it really makes you wonder and you get the guys to like, what do you mean you haven't seen double gun seven? And like, no, I haven't seen double guns one through six either, whatever those might be. It's, it's not enough time in a day for stuff like that. But on the topic of lists and whatnot, what are five films that you would recommend people see in any genre, any medium? Sure. Uh, give me one sec. I actually, I wrote them down this morning cause I, I didn't, I knew I would blank on them. And so yeah. I made sure to, <laughs> I made sure to, to, uh, to, to write them down here. So first up, I gotta, I gotta give some love to my boy, Albert Pune. So I gotta recommend Albert Pune's nemesis as something that everybody should see. That is a, a batshit insane sci-fi action movie that was about seven years before the matrix. Uh, and yet you can see that the Wachowskis, let's just say, were very, very aware of Nemesis's existence when they <laughs> when they made the Matrix. Um, for people, you know, a lot of people, we just got Jawan, the new Shura Khan movie, mm-hmm. out this week. A lot of people are uh, ever since RRR are dipping their toes into Indian cinema. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite ones that I recommend everybody check out is called War, directed by Siddhartha Nand. Stars uh, Rithik Rosan, who's one of the biggest stars in in Bollywood, and my favorite Bollywood actor, Tiger Shroff, who's kind of one of the only sort of martial arts stars in India. There's there's a handful of them, uh, but he's certainly kind of the most the biggest, um, even though he's hated by a lot of people. But <laughs> war is a war is a a James Bond esque spy extravaganza, explosions, bombs, shootouts, the whole nine yards. It's an absolute blast of a movie. So um, yeah, I really, <laughs> I really do recommend that one for everybody. It's it's a great, it's a great gateway drug for other Indian action cinema. Um, and then the next one, I have to uh, give a a recent recommendation. I did talk about this on the show, but uh, one of my favorite DTV directors is a guy by the name of William Kaufman, who uh, is, is toiling in the DTV trenches and should not be. He's a phenomenal director. And especially when it comes to tactical action, he's ex military and he brings such an authenticity to his action scenes. It's, it's unreal. He's actually put out three movies this year. One of them, not very good at all. The other one was okay, but one that he put out called The Channel is absolutely stunning. It is it is I think easily the best DTV movie, DTV action movie so far this year. Uh it, it is the type of movie that makes me love DTV action. It's why I keep suffering through uh a lot of these movies and why I'm constantly prowling Tubi for for new things. Uh so I I really recommend that one. Oh, Clayne Crawford's in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Clayne Crawford's the main character. It's Clayne Crawford and Max Martini. Um, they play brothers who are uh, a bank robbery goes sideways, and uh, they uh, they have to try and get out of New Orleans uh, with the money while the police and gangsters are hunting them down. It shows it, Kaufman makes full use of of New Orleans. This is not the French Quarter, New Orleans. This is this is the areas where where white tourists don't go in New Orleans, and uh, and it's one of those. I hate that. I hate the term. The city's like a character itself. I really that drives me nuts. But there really is no way to describe it other than the city is like a character itself in this movie. Um, so it's it's a great. I don't want to say it's a great time because it's a pretty gnarly movie, but it's it's a great great example of of direct to video action this sounds Um, like a great time by the way yeah yeah i i loved it i absolutely just adored everything about this movie um just even the the bank shootout alone if you're not hooked by that then you're not going to be but i think almost anybody who at least is interested in action movies will be absolutely hooked by the bank shootout um all right, then the next one is uh, one of the things I always rail on or rail about is how dance movies are really just martial arts movies in disguise. And uh, so I got I to gotta throw out 
Step Up 3, which is, uh, I think, probably the pinnacle of modern dance movies in terms of choreography and stuff like that. And it's, I mean, there's even Capoeira in it. They incorporate Capoeira into one of the dance routines. So, I mean, this is really, you know, and it's directed by John Chu, who went on to direct G.I. Joe. Um, And so this is a, a great martial arts movie but it's a dance movie. Uh, mm-hmm. It's about this dance crew. They're 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 in a tournament. They have to they have to battle a bunch of other dance crews in this tournament. It's staged just they're staged just like martial arts fights. Uh, so I really really do when people roll their eyes when I say that, but I really do try and and push people on that because if you like choreography in martial arts, there's no reason not to enjoy choreography in a dance movie either. I mean, it's the same thing. It's physic people at the height of their physical prowess moving beautifully. Uh, and so I, I just think, you know, that's, that's the one that I rec- always recommend to people out of that series. Uh, Cause I think it's, it's not my favorite one. Step up five is actually my favorite, but step up five is kind of like the Avengers of the series. They bring all the old <laughs> characters back. So it's not where you want to start. That's not the one you want to start with. Um, and oh, then the I, last, oh, go real ahead, quick Douglas. before you get to that one, uh, for those of you that, um, uh, maybe G.I. Yeah, Joe isn't the direction that you heard that and you want to go in. John, this is the same John Chu and, Chu, and I thought it was familiar. He did In the Heights and Crazy Rich Agents. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and In the Heights is just chock full of musical yeah. numbers, he, uh, of course. I he, did check. I, it has a different uh, uh, choreographer, I believe. Yes. That's, that's a bit of a bummer because I was... I, I like the dance sequences in the heist. By the way, I'm going through and adding each of these recommendations to my letterbox <laughs> so, watch list. So let so. me nerd out about John Chu for a sec. Um, so it. John Chu got his start making a documentary on dancers, particularly hip hop dancers and sort of some of the more cutting edge dance styles. And he was so enamored by these guys and, and he used a lot of them in step up too. He was so enamored by them that he actually formed his own dance crew called the Legion of Extraordinary Dancers, the LXD. And they made a, they, they did an entire web series on it. You can go on Hulu or YouTube. There's a whole web series featuring all these dancers. And these are the same dancers that he brings into step up three. Uh, So chew and dancing are uh, tied together. And the reason I brought up GI Joe is because I actually like the first Stephen Summers GI Joe a little better than retaliation, but chew does bring a lot of that dance style, especially for those who've seen it, the, the mountainside fight with snake eyes uh, where he's fighting all the ninjas on the side of the mountain. You know, that is a, that is John chew is what was that with blink, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, Yeah. yeah, With jinx. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jinx. Yeah, and that is a John Chu as hell fight. Um, and so, you know, again, if you want to see that translated to dancing, that's what John Chu does. That's what Step Up Three does for you. So it's very cool. Well worth checking out. I am I I have no idea when I'm gonna have free time coming up, but you've I've heard you talk about Step Up 3D before. Uh, and I've seen some of the threads that you've done on it. Now, now you've really sold this to me. So I'm gonna ask a legitimate question. No joking, no anything. If you haven't seen the other Step Up films, can you jump into three? Yeah, is it a yeah, standalone. Yeah, it's it's standalone ish. The main character is in Step Up Two, but it, you don't really need to know. They 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 establish it well enough. There's not a lot of backstory for him. Step okay. Up Three. So Step Up One is a very self contained movie with Channing Tatum and. Uh, his ex-wife that's actually where they met mm-hmm. it's my least favorite of the series it's it's a very very standard romeo and juliet high school drama kind of movie step up two is really where they start bringing in the street dancing and the the breaking and the the stuff like that the popping and, and all of that stuff would you say that that's where they step it up that is indeed where they step it up okay, uh, and then they to continue sure. to step it up after that um but three yeah three has some characters but there's no real art overarching stories really five is the only one that you can't watch as a standalone five is five is entirely a fan service this is probably the last step up movie we're going to get to make so we're going to go all fan service on it so um that's probably really the only one you can't watch without watching the others i don't hey i think you got one more left right is that four? yeah yeah, and so I have to take the chance, as I do anytime I get the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite musicals of all time, which is Anna and the Apocalypse, John yes. McHale's, uh horror musical. 
Uh, I adore it. I watch it at least once every year. My wife and I, we watch it on November 1st. It's our, it's the movie we transition from Halloween into Christmas with. Uh, so we always watch it every November 1st. Um, I've got posters all over our house. Um, if people haven't seen it, it's a musical uh, about high school students during a zombie invasion. And uh, it is fantastic. It's, it's funny, heartbreaking. The music is just incredible. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love it. I can't, uh, and, you know, and we're, we're on the cusp of fantastic fest and it, yep. it, it had its big U S premiere at fantastic fest. So I, it's very topical at this point as well. So love that movie. Can't sing his praises highly enough. There you go. I, um, I, I saw, I think, it, I, I think it was on blue sky. Uh, Scott Mendelson had made some comment about Anna and the apocalypse. And so I just in all caps yelled at him about how now all I can do is sing Hollywood ending. And that's yep. the soundtrack is so good. I went and saw that by myself, sadly, for my birthday. I always go out to a movie for my birthday and it was the middle of the week. Everybody was working and we had one child at that time. So my wife stayed home with him and I I went off to that. But that was my birthday movie and it is amazing. And if uh, for those of you who haven't checked it out, there's a home release. It is an import, if I remember right, but it's region free. And it yeah. comes with the original film that the director who is, if I remember right, has since passed away. But the creator of Anne and the Apocalypse uh, based it off of. And you can sort of see where the original mm -hmm. seeds were. It wasn't a musical, if I remember right, at the time. No, it actually is. It's were. called it's called a zombie musical. It actually Was is it? a musical. Yeah. Yeah. There, but I think there's only one or two songs in it because it's a short film. So maybe that's why I don't yeah. remember. Maybe yeah. that's why I don't remember. We've only watched that once, whereas Anne in the Apocalypse, uh, Crystal, my wife, was actually just singing some of the songs earlier today uh, because that's how we roll. So, yes. Yeah, that that Blu-ray release is from Second Sight, and uh, I highly recommend it because it's also got the longer festival cut of, mm -hmm. of Anna and the Apocalypse, which is the version that was shown at Fantastic Fest. It's about got about 20 minutes more, including a couple of extra songs. So I do recommend uh, tracking down that Blu-ray. It's it's well worth it. Daryl, I uh, I can't remember. Have you seen Anna and the Apocalypse? Uh, no, I do not believe I have. Hmm. Hmm. We uh, uh, Mike, for the if in case you don't know, we will occasionally challenge each other to watch movies. Uh, and when we don't have a guest, we usually challenge each other to something. He's challenged me to watch uh, Nocturnal Animals for our upcoming episode because I have yet to see that. And he was speaking so highly of it. I have challenged him to see all kinds of movies, several of which were probably directed direct to video and he has not enjoyed most of them yeah, that's correct that is a correct statement yes. amusingly this one uh he has still not seen the end of little shop of horse i can't remember why you did not make it to the end of that one i'm not trying to pick on you but uh i forget why you couldn't make it to the end of that one maybe you'll make it to the end of anna and the apocalypse uh, maybe. All right. Let's we'll get uh, you ready to get down for the get down for today. I topic? am. I am ready. The topic for today, and we picked it special uh, be, when when uh, when we were considering guests, and we were like, could we get Mike on the show to talk about this? We thought talking about martial arts movies would be an excellent way to go about that. And so, for in terms of martial arts movies, because there's a wide swath of them, there's the films that I know I watched as a kid, like Three Ninjas, American Ninja, which is about to get a Blu-ray release, along with American Ninja 2 from Kino Lorber. You've got the Karate Kid back like the 80s Karate Kid. You've also got the more recent Karate Kid, but you've got Ip Man, Fist of Fury, New Fist of Fury, Only the Strong, the John Wick movies, Lionheart, Kung Fu Hustle and Ong Bak, Shaolin Soccer, Police Story, Mortal Kombat, uh, <laughs> Kung Fu Panda, Ninja Assassin, speaking of Fantastic Fest, and The Raid, to name a few. All of these are action movies, certainly, but they're also martial arts films featuring different styles of martial arts. Uh, so, uh, Mike, as our guest, would you like to go first or would you like one of us to? Um, you know what? I'll let you guys start just because that way, if if you guys come up with something, I I I can easily come up with something else so that we don't have the same movie. So no I'll problem. actually let you guys start. So not a problem. Daryl, I'll go first. I'll go first. I decided to break this up for myself into three categories. 
uh, this it made it so much easier for me to navigate what I would pick from because uh, I've got everything from like something classy, like something I'll name in a minute, to something less classy, like Three Ninjas, <laughs> which was sort of my introduction to this stuff. So I decided to go with a film that was an in my introduction to martial arts cinema, and it's one of my hands down favorite films for a multitude of reasons. We have talked about it on the show, but I cannot encourage people to watch it enough. 1986, John Carpenter, Big Trouble in Little China. Jack Burton <laughs> would tell you that this film, old Jack would tell you that this film is one of the greatest martial arts movies, if only because it leads you to think that old Jack, played by Kurt Russell, is the hero of this movie. He's the fucking clown. And it's played so beautifully and it's balanced so well that this is not a white savior film. This is uh, he's our way into this, quote unquote, universe of magic and mysticism of the Tong Wars that are happening in San Francisco. However, he is so out of his depth. He is so out of his element. And if not for his friends, he would not survive any of this. But it's it's one of it was probably my first James Hong movie. <laughs> uh, and it's a film that particularly as a child scared the crap out of me because of that sort of uh, orb eyeball creature and the uh, Sasquatch like thing that shows up and uh, rears its ugly head at the end of the film. But this was one of my way in. And this was particularly because a lot of the action films and the com and the comedies that I like have a specific rhythm and timing. This film has that. This was probably my first John Carpenter film um, as well. But this was my way into what physical comedy, what martial arts could be, and how these can all work together. So that's that's my first call. Uh, I, like I know, you're you shocked, Daryl. You're shocked. <laughs> Absolutely not. He threw out the term white savior as if Jack saved anything. Oh, <laughs> no, that's just what I'm saying. It's not. Absolutely. It's absolutely yeah, not. not even, uh, a good riff, actually, on the white savior. I mm -hmm. love this movie. I double checked uh, to peel the curtain back a little. It is on the 100 action movie list. There's no way I was not going to put this movie on the list. I will not reveal its place for now. But uh, yeah, <laughs> I revisited mm, maybe like four or five months ago to see if it was going to place on the list and it's still such a blast from beginning to end i love everything about this movie i think it's my second james hong i might have saw blade runner first but uh but yeah this this movie is is everything it's it's my second favorite kim control movie i love this movie to death is is mannequin first no mannequin is not first <laughs> that would be star trek six is first <laughs> Michael, do you have anything on Big Trouble in Little China? I mean, what can I add to Big Trouble in Little China? It's it's amazing. You know, it's the most, arguably the most Hong Kong movie that's ever been made, not in Hong Kong. You know, uh, <laughs> for those who don't know, part of the reason it got made is because Carpenter saw Choi Hawk's uh, Zoo Warriors from Magic Mountain and uh, and flipped shit for it. And so, uh, sorry, can we swear on this? Is oh, this absolutely. A, fucking okay, lovely. okay, all right. Just, I, I, I normally ask, right, Flip shit for it and tried to wanted to do his own version of that. So that's why it's got all these, you know, the wild tonal shifts and stuff like that. If you've watched any 80s Hong Kong movies, they are known for just absurd tonal shifts. Oh, They're yeah. also known, a lot of them are known for doofus heroes. And, <laughs> and and Carpenter really nails that. You know, he nails the whole idea here that the Jack thinks he's the hero of this story, and he is not. He is this is this is this is Wang's story mm -hmm. and we're, we're just not seeing it. We're stuck with this idiot for the entire movie. Um, and I, I love it. It's, you know, that technique has been tried uh, uh, some time since, you know, like most notably Tom Cruise's night and day. And I think it's almost impossible to pull off and Carpenter mm -hmm. pulls it off amazingly Be in the large part because Russell is so game to be yes. such an idiot, such yes. a buffoon for this movie. I mean, yeah. he is he is just sending up his personality, Snake Plissken, taking it, lighting it on fire and, you know, and, and throwing it out the window. And uh, yeah, it's a masterful movie. I mean, there's just nothing else I can add to it. Uh, the the only thing I can I can hope for and I continue to do so. I don't know the behind the scenes on it 
it's one of the few John Carpenter's uh, because they've there's been this push for a lot of 4K releases with The Thing and um, Halloween and a few others that where's this one? I want this one in 4K. I want to see this one not necessarily cleaned up, cleaned up. I want it to have that grain and that grittiness. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I do. I do want that. I do. I'm a little worried because it's a Fox movie. So, Uh, you know, that restoration there, you know, they're they're starting to they're starting to announce them. Yeah, there's there's some rumor has it. We're going to start getting some of uh, what's his name? Uh, True Lies and a Cameron. Cameron. Yeah, Yeah. Cameron, James Cameron. And and I never thought I'd see Prey. I never I never in a million years. I never thought Prey would would come out on physical media. So, I mean, maybe Disney's not burying all the Fox movies like we thought we can we can hope at least. Fingers crossed. Fingers, Fingers crossed. crossed. We are big fans of physical media here at the cinema. <laughs> so here's hoping. By the way, um, Douglas, I'll be showing Prey in theater September 30th for my birthday. That is the plan. Uh, you are invited. Um, you. Yeah, that's good call. You came, came out the gate swinging on that one, sir. I did not expect to see that. Uh, but this is a martial arts show, so you should come out of the gate swinging. I know, right? Um, I thought, thought I had my list all set, and then you mentioned the raid, and I realized that the raid was not on my list. Uh, but I will stick true to what I already had laid out. My first joint comes. I took martial arts like as literally as I possibly could, and I went old school with mine from 1978. A jump called the Five Deadly Venoms. I love everything about this movie. It has for me one of the best premises premises premise premises of a movie um the premise of the movie ever <laughs> it's absolutely bonkers and if you've never heard of five deadly venoms sometimes it's just called the five venoms basically it, it is such a kung fu master teaches five dudes in five different styles each named after animals lizard centipede snake toad stuff like that um sends them out into the world he had if i recall correctly he had like an instructor that assisted him that guy came into a little bit of money later on down the road and the instructor was like hmm i don't know what those five guys are up to and i didn't really trust them all so he trained a sixth guy and gave him a little bit of each of those five different elements and said go into the city make sure my guy is safe my old friend is safe because i feel like some of them are going to try to get him for this money by the way, when I trained them, they all wore masks, so we don't know what they look like, and they all took new names when they went to the city. So you have a guy that has no idea what these guys look like, mm-hmm. how to suss them out, and if he can trust them, if he can suss them out. And it is a great setup for a movie and having to get beaten, wailed on by different guys just to suss out their style as they're beating on them. Like, oh, that was kind of a little bit of the lizard style there. I don't, I don't know if I can trust this guy or not. It is amazing. And it culminates in one of my, uh, I would say like top 15, top 20 favorite fight scenes at the end of a movie. Uh, and for, what is this? 102 minutes, a lot of shit happens in 102 minutes. It's paced great, a couple of bits of humor in there. Um, sampled heavily by the Wu-Tang Clan, which is always plus five points for me. I love everything about the five bedrooms. I know nothing about this one. Is, <laughs> oh, is... Douglas. Oh, no, hey, oh hey. you are you are in. No, I'm not judging you. I, didn't I am think envious. You, <laughs> you are in for a treat when you sit down and watch this one. You you've got a good time ahead of you. Yeah, because this is Shaw Brothers, Hong, uh, Hong Kong Cinema, uh, added it to the watch list. Uh, I think Prime Video has a bunch of Shaw yeah. Brothers stuff. Oh, so yeah, I they, will. I will check that out. They do, and uh, and yeah. So this is actually one of uh, Chang Chaz's movies, who's known for uh, being the bloodiest of the Shaw Brothers directors. Uh, this also started what was called the Venom Mob, which was a bunch of in-house stunt guys who would then go on to star in a series of movies basically playing variations of the five deadly venoms. Um, Daryl, if you have not seen the crippled Avengers, Mm -hmm. you need to see that one because that is, I think even better than five deadly venoms. It's been sitting in my watch list for years now. You need to see it. It's amazing. Um, So yeah, this is, this is where Shaw brothers was really at the peak of their powers um, and, and doing creative 
really interesting stuff and really pushing a lot of martial arts cinema forward. So this is this is a great call. Absolutely great pick. Uh, much appreciated. Much appreciated. Uh, in addition to my hundred action movie list, I'm also doing like a uh, like an old 70s, 80s or 60s, I think in some cases, Kung Fu list as well. So every every once in a while, if I have free time, I'll, I'll pull one up and, and add it to the list and, and get a watch. Man, that's I think Five Venoms is somewhere in my top 10. Love it. Right on. All right. Mike, floor is yours, sure, sir. Yeah. So uh, I, I you guys killed me on this, like asking me <laughs> of all people to narrow it down to three. So what I tried to do was somewhat similar to what you said you, you did, Douglas, was try and come up with three different types of movies uh, that, that I think are at least in some way representative of the broad scope of martial arts movies. So for my first one, because I got to stay on brand, I'm going DTV. Uh, I'm recommending what I think is maybe the peak of a, at least Western martial arts, Western direct to video martial arts, and maybe the peak of just Western martial arts movies, period. Uh, it is, Undisputed Three, starring my boy Scott Atkins. <laughs> um, <laughs> to me, Undisputed Three perfects the tournament fighting movie, which is a, a long-standing, uh, you know, trope in martial arts movies. Uh, Enter the Dragons, a tournament movie. Bloodsport, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think Undisputed Three is the peak of that. Not necessarily in terms of story or or anything like that. I mean, nobody's ever going to beat Enter the Dragon, right? Arguably. What I think, though, is Undisputed Three is the peak of human martial arts on screen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is where I came up with when the first time I saw this, long before I met Scott and knew him, um, I started calling him the human special effect because the way he moves in this movie, gravity just does not apply to him. Uh, and, and the same with the, the, his antagonist in it played by the great Marco Zoror speaking again of John wick, uh, you know, and so this to me, if somebody just wants to know what pure martial arts cinema looks like, uh, it's hard to go wrong with undisputed three. I, I think it's as good as it gets. Right on. I saw the first Undisputed, and I never, uh, I never checked out the other ones after that. I will. Oh, the others are the others. I like the first Undisputed a lot. It's Walter Hill. It's really good. But the others are, and, it, and it's got Scott doing his most famous character, which is uh, the, the Russian Yuri Boyka, who's been given one gift from God. He's the most complete fighter in the world. Um, it's it's a brilliant character. It's a great character. I've I've written a ton about him. Um, so yeah, you should check him out, Daryl. I think you'll really like him. Sold. Already on the watch list. I will. I will go and add that as well. I've been getting more familiar with Scott Atkins. I think I I knew of him. But I couldn't have like picked him out of a lineup. But then I saw Triple Threat, which Wellgo released, and and he played the bad guy in that. And then I checked out Avengement, which with that he did with Jesse V. Johnson, and that movie, movie is fucking incredible. Yep, I love Avengement. And then there was just this run of films that he would show up in, and eventually it was like someone asked me if I wanted to do. Um, oh damn it, I can't think of the with Louis Mandalore. Uh, Jack Collector. Yes, the debt collector. I was asked if I'd do the sequel, and I was like, well, I haven't seen the first one, so I guess I gotta watch the first one. And so I did that, and that was so much fun that I was like, all right, I don't know how they're gonna do a sequel, considering the way that the first one ends, but they did it anyway, and who gives a shit? And it was a good time too. They got better. Yeah, they literally <laughs> just said they got better. I love it. I love it. Excellent. <laughs> it was, I mean, you're not wrong. All right, Douglas, but, we are back over to you, sir. All right, uh, I I am going to apparently uh, be in line with you, Daryl, a little bit. With this one, I decided to go with a film that I felt like was important to the yeah. genre as a whole. Um, and certainly one of the things that I've enjoyed over the last couple of years, starting around 2020, I was able to make some connections and, and I've started to review a lot of these in some cases, first time restorations or first time release outside of Japan or or what have you. And this isn't from Japan, but this was a film by uh, King Hu that I'd never seen before. The 1966 Come Drink With Me. And in watching this film, and I've talked about it on the show before, when a lot of people think of uh, Wushu cinema uh, and this sort of artistic 
uh, way of fighting, a lot of people go to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. This came out decades before that. And you've got Cheng Pei Pei, who was the lead of that film. She uh, played a character by the name of Golden Swallow. She is trying to track down bandits who have kidnapped the son of a governor. In 1966, having a female lead of this strength and magnitude, who is taking on gangs, was not something very common that you would see. And this was, if I remember correctly, a Shaw, Shaw Brothers. Yeah, this was this was early, early Shaw Brothers. Uh, and she was this actress, Cheng Pei Pei, uh, as I understand, if I remember right, she was not a martial artist by trade. She was a dancer. So a lot of the movements that we then see later in cinema were sort of inspired by that and her movements and, of course, been perfected by those that are both dancers and martial artists or get martial arts training. But this film is remarkable for the way that it tells its story. It's also part of his um, in trilogy. I've seen two out of the three. Uh, I still need to see the last one. But uh, it's it's a beautiful story. The fight scenes are great. And the only thing that, that bothers me about this movie is the fact that there's a secondary male character that we meet who does a great job of supporting her, but then at some point sort of becomes the lead of the film in a way that makes you go, did they just lack confidence in, 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 in her role or her ability to do it? But what I discovered in my research for this, um, for this review is that the story itself is actually based on an opera. So is adapting some other pieces work. So the issues that to me exist with Income Drink With Me probably existed in that source material as well. But there is no denying the influence that this film back from 1966 had in the ripple effects that continue into modern martial arts cinema. So, Cheng Pei Pei, for those wondering, is your main villain in their aforementioned Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Uh, she is the dopeness, and I will hate her forever for how that movie <laughs> <laughs> transpires. <laughs> um, and I think she's also part of that documentary that was on Netflix. Uh, she was. A couple years ago, right? Yeah, she's yeah, one yeah. of the original female uh, action or uh, these martial arts stars coming out mm -hmm. of there. So nice to see her get some shine. Good pull on that. You have talked about that on the show before, mm -hmm. and it is one that I did not have added to my watch list that is now on my watch list. Good call, sir. If you need it, I'm looking right at it. Right there. Good man. Good man. Um, yeah, it it's hard to beat King Hugh. Uh, just, just absolutely phenomenal filmmaker. Uh, his movies are, you know, if people think that all martial arts movies are just people getting punched in the head, show them... <laughs> show him come drink with me or a touch of Zen and, uh, and, you know, show them that, you know, martial arts and art are not, uh, are not mutually exclusive things. Great, great call. Thank you. Good call. For now for a movie where everyone gets punched in the head. <laughs> no, I, you did yeah. one, didn't you? You did the one. <laughs> first of all, Hey, I, I fucked heavy with, with one. That was my first <laughs> Delroy Lindo movie. And I was like, who is this guy? He's dope. Really? And it might have been my first Jason Statham movie as well. It might have been my first Jet Li movie. Shit. The heavy influence of the one. Uh, then then have you... Okay, I'm sorry to derail this, but I think the one came out after Romeo Must Die, which I think was the first time Lindo had worked with Lee. Yep. So I was like, shit, they're working together again. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you hadn't seen that yet? No, no. I think uh, I saw... I saw... Uh, Romeo must die like years later down oh, okay. the road. Yeah. Still great. Watched it within the last couple of years. Rewatched it within the last couple of years. It still makes me sad looking at Aaliyah. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah, my second movie. I'm 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 gonna toss this one out, but I do want to give it a quick shout. I already did an old school kung fu ish type movie. I was gonna do two, but I will vary my list. A shout out to Shaolin and Wu Tang with Gordon Liu, which is uh I rewatched the final fight scene right before we started and God damn it, that's just a good movie. Uh, I will pivot to, uh, we talked about Wuxia with yours. I will throw my Wuxia in there. Douglas, it's, that's the one that I was like, do I do one or the other? I'm going not Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, but I'm going with Hero. Uh, See, this is why I wanted you guys to go first, because <laughs> I literally was just about to pick Hero. <laughs> so this is why I'm glad you guys went first. <laughs> I need a new third film. Thanks, <laughs> asshole. 
Uh, looks like we have one film of commonality there on the list. Uh, so we can all go ahead and uh, get it out of our system now. It It is, to me, I think, for me, the pinnacle of the entire genre that is Wuxia, in that it has some of the most beautiful fight scenes that you will see. The story is heavily layered and nuanced and thematic throughout, and every performance with all the different levels and knowing what character knows what, what doesn't know what is incredibly uh, subtle, again, layered. It's it's played beautifully all throughout. Um, if, until my first introductions, this is my first Tony Leung movie. And, and I'm like, oh, wow, who the fuck is this guy in here? The, the colors that they chose, the color palette that changes throughout the movie, that, that kind of gives you a, a sense of where you are, what time frame, who's who's what character you're attached to through all this it it is storytelling in a way that i hadn't quite seen up to this point i didn't feel like anybody in in western cinema was doing anything like this uh when they made hero and it's it's a visual feast it it leaves you with something to contemplate and you don't quite get those kind of endings in western movies that you get in a movie like this I, I agree completely. Um, obviously, it was my third freaking movie. Uh, <laughs> but this was probably my first Zhang Yimao film. Uh, and I came across it presented by Quentin Tarantino. You know, or something like that. And yeah, it was. It was. Say, That's what, say, uh... say what you will about Tarantino, but he, like Scorsese and a number of other prominent filmmakers they lift up other voices from from world cinema and that's why i saw this i knew jet lee from lethal weapon 4 <laughs> that was probably my first introduction that was american's him. first introduction to him mm -hmm. uh, i think that was his first big american like like that that was his intro to everybody here but i agree with you uh tony lee young maggie chung donnie yen uh zeng Z, uh zeng zia i knew from uh, crouching tiger but she was also in this so all those folks i didn't know who they were and donnie Yen maybe by the time i'd seen this 2002 donnie Yen would have been in blade 2 donnie Yen maybe had been in uh what was it called highlander endgame yeah he he'd been in, in he'd oh. been in endgame he'd been in blade 2 this was actually so hero was actually for those who don't know, Donnie got blacklisted for a while uh, because Donnie is a um, he's an intense man and he can kind of be a dick and he pissed off Yun Wu Ping. Ooh, and uh, so Donnie person. Donnie got blacklisted for a while. He had to go. He ended up doing stunt choreography in Japan for a while and was a, a bit in the wilderness. That's when he tried to break through in the U.S. Um, Hero was his big kind of one of his big comebacks to to China and uh you know and the rest is history he's, he's never tripped since he's just been yeah. on a on a steamroller ever since but uh so yeah it, it wouldn't surprise me that this was uh you know their first Donnie movie for a lot of people yeah mm -hmm. and it's and it's remarkable uh just I love that sequence so much because of the way that it communicates the different ways in which martial arts can take place as much of it happens in the mind and that they have the entire fight before the single blade is thrown and they already know who's going to do what and who's it, it's it's mythical mm -hmm. and it is absolutely uh for lack of a better term magical uh everything you've said daryl i absolutely agree with it's it's what put me on to this director as well. And yes, I saw The Great Wall and I like The Great Wall. Uh, it has its moments in terms Great of wall action rocks. sequences. What Great was that? Wall rocks. The Great Wall rocks. The there you go. Great Wall rules. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like Zhang Yimou is is one of my very favorite directors. He's he's a, he's a legend. You know, Daryl, you said nobody was doing movies like this in the West. Nobody was really doing movies like this in China either. I mean, he he is he is on an upper echelon he's in that spielberg scorsese you know echelon of, of all-time great filmmakers uh his trilogy that this is kind of a, his his thematic trilogy that this is a part of is is with house of flying daggers and curse of the golden flower are all great now if you guys haven't seen 
his most recent martial arts movie called Shadow that came out about five years ago. Absolutely stunning movie. Just absolutely yes. jaw-droppingly yes. stunning movie. My wife was like, are you going to put Shadow on your list? And I was like, I'm thinking about it because we rewatched it for the action movie list uh, a couple months ago. And she was like, that's one to put on there. Yeah, it's 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 stunning. I, I'm, if I remember right, I think that was my my best movie of the year. The year it came out, um, I think that was my pick for best movie of the year. That I, that thing just blew me away. Yeah, look out! I love that movie. I, I know it was on my favorites list. Legitimately, at some point, I will go through and find it because I started keeping a favorites list at, on Letterboxd as of like 2017. I forget what year it came out, but uh, no, Shadow Shadow is. One of the best films that I had seen that year. Oh. I recommend it all the time. Oh, so good. All the time. As far as cinematography goes, I'm a huge cinematography nerd. And that one is right. Oh, that beauty, beauty. Anyways. Uh, and, the, and the staging of the fight sequences with the with the, 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 umbrellas, the umbrella man. blades and yeah. the like riding down. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. There's just too much that is good about that movie. Yeah. 2018. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you guys need to scramble to find some new picks there. Mm. I got. Maybe. I'm good. I'm good. I, I I had a backup. Like I said, I knew I'd be able to come up with a backup, so that was no problem. Uh, I'm going to keep us in the Wuxia theme, but I'm going to go a little more, a little less, uh, you know, mystical and magical, and a lot more um, straight up punches and kicks in the face. And I am uh, I'm going to recommend uh, Yen Wu Ping's Iron Monkey, starring the aforementioned Donnie Yen. Um, my pick for for <sighs> it's tough. Depending on the day, I argue that either Hero or this is the greatest martial arts movie of all time. Um, Ooh. And uh, and Iron Monkey is is they're very different, but Iron Monkey is just for pure martial arts insanity. It cannot be beat. Um, Donnie Yen plays uh, Wang Kei Ying, who is the father of Chinese legend Wang Fei Hung, who is, for those who are familiar, was played by Jet Li in the Once Upon a Time in China series. There's this, Wang Fei Hung is in this as a small child, but he is uh, he is in this village where there is this masked bandit known as the Iron Monkey, played by uh, Yu Rong Guan, who is. Uh, He's basically Donnie Yen's character is basically brought in to try and stop this guy. But what you find out is the Iron Monkey's actually like a Robin Hood. He's robbing from the rich to help help the poor. And he's a doctor in his day job. So he's, you know, he's trying to help the downtrodden. They end up having to team up against a corrupt general. All you need to know is the final fight is between these three guys on stilts that are on fire. <laughs> so they're 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 standing on stilts above a pit of fire. Uh, jumping from stilt to stilt as they're trying to fight. It is Yen Wu Ping at his most unhinged choreography. It is Donnie Yen at his fastest. It is just a tremendous, tremendous martial arts movie. Uh, Shout Factory either just put it out. I've got the Eureka version from the UK, um, but Shout Factory just put it out or, e or is putting it out this year uh, here in the US. Uh, I highly recommend picking it up. It is It is as good as these kind of movies get. I remember seeing the trailer for this movie when it came out. Uh, and yeah, I was it, like, got, I, it got the Weinstein release here where they, they, you know, Miramaxed it. It was still, yeah. it was still worth it, but it, it it's going to be the shout factory version, I believe is going to be the uncut Chinese version. Um, okay. So it'll be worth picking it up. Excellent. Right. I, I, I need to add that to the list then. I wanted to go see that so bad. And for whatever reason, I did not make it out to the theaters to go see that. Now, Doug, you checked that Iron Monkey? I have not. It's it's one of many Donnie Yen films that I still need to catch up on. It's <laughs> I'm old enough to remember Suncoast Records. And when I was in school at UNC Asheville, I would if I went to the mall, they had a Suncoast. And that's where I'd see Iron Monkey and a bunch of other at that time imported films. And whether it was VHS or maybe about that time, DVD. And uh, they were like 40, 50 bucks. And I went, yeah, <laughs> no. Yep. So I was just about I to make get... that joke of it with Suncoast. It was going to cost you about a good $45. Yeah. So I'm I'm slowly working my way through. And while the quality is a little mixed with some of the Shout Factory stuff, 
uh, they are at least, I have to give them credit. They're putting together, they've now done two Jackie Chan collections. They've done some Sonny Chiba ones that uh, I'd still like to check out. They've uh, 88 films has been doing some wonderful work with Donnie Yen films. I've actually got uh, it's releasing on the. As of this recording tomorrow, I still need to watch it. The Postman fights back with Chow Young Fat. I need to check that out. Um, so there's there's a lot of great martial arts films that are starting to get solid restorations and releases, which at least with 88 films, they they provide the. Hong Kong version and then the international version. And I'm just going to tell you guys straight up, stick with stick with the Hong Kong version. There's probably a reason why it got cut in the inter- in in our area and you don't want any of that. Like I think it was Police Story 3, the opening for to some like midnight bowling opening that makes no sense to the film as a whole and New Fist New Fist of Fury is basically a Jackie Chan movie that makes no sense in the larger scope of what New Fist of Fury was trying to do as a sequel to Fist of Fury. They cut out the sequel part. So if you get to track these down, please watch the Hong Kong original versions. Fucking Weinstein's. Uh, yeah, Almost fucking, all yes. of them are are Weinstein's. It, fucking Harvey got Harvey and Bob got their paws all over these movies and just destroyed them. Um, <clears throat> Iron Monkey is on Shout Factory, available now. There's 229 left in stock, <laughs> and I get paid on Friday. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Excellent. There you go. Uh, Douglas, I'll be back over to you. Uh, let's see. He did Iron Monkey. You did Hero. I guess yes. We are in the final round, and I'm gonna just uh, reply with another big old fuck you for taking Hero. Uh, that was just to make it clear. That was gonna be my film that I think is one of the best of the genre. Mm-hmm. That that was the category I picked for that. And I within that scope, I cannot find it just a quick replacement. So instead, uh, I've decided. Hmm. Do I do I want to do I want to be like can't fucking believe it came from that director or wild and out of the box for most U.S. audiences? Whichever one you prefer, sir. All right, I'm going to go with I can't believe it came from this director. So uh, Fast X, directed by Lewis Letterer, that director has done The Incredible Hulk, which I actually like. He's done Now You See Me, Clash of Titans, Grimsby, Transporter 2, Take Down, and is reportedly doing Fast X Part 2. But the movie that he did that I can't believe he did and is one of my favorite movies, 2005's Unleashed. It has some of the best action sequences, but it also has an incredible drama attached to it. Is that the uh, the Danny the Dog joint? Yes, it is. Yep. Lewis. And and I was doing my review of Fast X and I was looking up Louie to... uh, to, you know, having my review, here's something you might know him from. And I was like, Motherf- he did what? <laughs> I would not have pegged that, particularly because in 05, when I saw this, perhaps 06, I wouldn't have known who that director was. Um, So it wouldn't have stood out to me. Me, I'm watching it because it's Jet Li, it's Morgan Freeman, Bob Hoskins. It's me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's Mario, me. Mario, me. thank you very much. Oh, okay, okay. But uh, yes, he goes by either name. But this film, for those of you that don't know, it is, I believe, based on a novel by Danny the Dog and Danny, who is Jet Li, had been raised by Bob Hoskins' character as a fighter. And he is he has a leash on him, a metal uh, clasp thingy. He's kept in a cage. And when the collar comes off, he immediately goes into fight mode. He's been conditioned uh, to do this. And it, this film is as much about him getting his freedom as as him getting his humanity back. So it is a beautiful story where the fights themselves aren't just about punching faces, which they do beautifully, but they're, they also convey character, which to me, a great fight sequence, much like a great dance sequence, as you pointed out, I would agree with that as well. A great sex scene, all of these things. <laughs> convey character and meaning they move the story forward in some way shape or form uh so uh, since you took hero from me in the category of i can't fucking believe this director made this movie 2005's unleashed which i personally think is fucking incredible that collar coming off and him just going that shit crazy is me when the crock pot hits hour six. 
<laughs> uh, good call. I I just clicked on like martial arts and combat the in letterbox to see what came up, and that was in there. And I was like, man, that would be a good call. So good You're pivot welcome. on that one, sir. Good You're pivot welcome. on that one. Uh, it Since you was, me. Since yeah, you fucked me. That's what I'm here for. It was initially titled Danny the Dog, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Did it yeah, just get it, like a US? The US release, release was unleashed. They changed the name in the US. It's Danny the Dog in France and the UK, but it's ah. unleashed in the US. Um, yeah, Greg, I love this movie. This is, uh, I can. I, I did a because uh, this is Scott Adkins is in this. So I did a, a podcast episode on this. And um, I I think we went it was me and my buddy Matt Esri. And I think we went like two, two and a half hours on this movie because that's how much we love this movie. Um, it, it's it's such a unique movie in terms of the combination of brutal fight scenes with like heartwarming um, story and. One of the things that's interesting about it is very few movies. It's weird to me that that no Chinese movie up until this point had captured Jet Li's inherent charm and charisma the way this movie did. You know, in so much of his Chinese work, he's the stoic badass. And he's, for lack of a better term, he's fucking adorable in this movie. Yeah. He, yeah. He's just, he's got a smile that lights up the entire screen. Uh, and then flips that switch when he has to start punching people. And it, yeah, this is this really is, I think, an underappreciated masterpiece in, in the genre. Uh, people know it, but I don't think people really appreciate it. What a unique film it is. And like you said, unique in Louis Leterrier's filmography, too. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I generally like his movies as well. But this is so head and shoulders above anything else he's ever directed um that you know it's it, yeah I, I think it's one that people need to see agreed uh michael you're gonna say no chinese movie had and i thought you were gonna say put morgan freeman in a film before and I, was, <laughs> <laughs> I was like okay well yeah he's, he's going somewhere with this but yeah I, I i think yeah there is a lot of underestimated charm to jet Li. That was just a side that was woefully unexplored in his career. You can almost see a little bit of it in the first Expendables as well. Um, woefully underutilized. One of one of the the fun things about as his career got bigger, uh, particularly in the U.S. I, I can't I can't speak for the other part because he already had a a healthy career before he tried to break in here. But stuff like the one, he got to be playful in that, and then in forget in the Forbidden Kingdom. With him as the monkey king, the monkey, like yeah. he's being ridiculous as all hell. It's great, and you and I agree with you, Mike, about how unleashed. You're, there's that scene of him. I think it was him eating ice cream and reacting to that for the first time, and you get to see this range that you don't always do. Uh, so movies like The Forbidden Kingdom One and Unleashed really allowed, particularly American audiences, to get to see more than just, as you put it, the stoic fighter. Or or someone who is in over their head or whatever, whatever the circumstance may be. Most of the movies that I love from him, like Romeo Must Die or Cradle of the Grave, he's usually um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, right. Kiss of the Dragon. He's usually some sort of operative who's coming into a situation to clean it up type of deal. But with these other films, he gets to stretch a little bit and do something different. So, I, yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. Good call. Oh. Good call. Yeah, damn. All right, Daryl. All right. Uh, my last one, like I just said a little bit ago, I just clicked on the the martial arts and intense combat on Letterbox to see what else was out there to make sure I wasn't missing anything. And by God, I was missing something. Uh, a, a series, a trilogy that I just recently came to, maybe like two years ago, and finally watched all three. I thought the first one came out in 2012, an adaptation of an anime which in and of itself was an adaptation of a manga Roroni Kenshin part one origins I good lord man this movie when I saw one two and three I I immediately declared it as one of my favorite trilogies just out of nowhere from nowhere to like top five maybe favorite trilogies of all time a great through line uh for uh the character of Roroni Kenshin uh a well-known you know that the well trod trope of the killer who doesn't want to be the killer anymore but 
inherently within that, just the most sweetest, warm-hearted man that you could possibly see. Like, they always try to make, like, the killer doesn't want to be a killer. Like, oh, but he also loved the gardening or something like that. Uh, looking at you, Jean Reno. But, <laughs> <laughs> but here they just fucking nail it. Like, this is a man who absolutely does not want to fight if he doesn't have to. And circumstances keep pulling him uh, back into the fight. And it's the story of uh, during Japanese imperialism time, if I remember correctly, and how, how we are in the rise of a new era of, of Japanese governance and those who are inherently fighting against that change and those who are fighting for that change and those who are attempting to exploit the chaos and, and the upheaval. It's kind of where we start uh, the whole the whole trilogy off. And it's, it's just wonderfully done. The fight scenes are amazing. The cinematography throughout is is top-notch and dope and it gave one of my favorite characters of all time his buddy that kind of that kind of just joins in adventures with him because he he loves the fight just uh, like a, a boxer who just loves the, the the thrill of a good fight he's always great for the comedic relief a nice little romance weave throughout there as well if you have a spare uh, 134 minutes it is i think almost all of them are streaming on netflix right now i tracked down those blu-rays because those were must buys in physical medium for me roni kinshin part one origins is my jam and uh for those of you that are fans of that and didn't know if i remember right the character who plays zero on one piece the live action is in these movies oh oh really yeah, okay. uh, I was looking into some of the cast. I have, I've gotten sucked into One Piece. <laughs> <laughs> you only have a thousand more to go. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm watching the I'm watching the live action TV show. Ah, okay. It, okay. It's it's been something that where when I've had free time, Neon Genesis is very heavy. Even if yeah, it's twenty it minutes, is. they're very dense and yeah, heavy. It and is. it's like a sixty minute uh, pirate fuck around show. I'm like, yes, I'll put you on for like five minutes at a time. Uh, and it's it's really entertaining as someone who has no experience with One Piece, but uh, the swordsman in the Central Pirate Crew, I believe he is in that series that you love. I right know he's right he's on. he's the villain in the in the fifth movie, uh, or uh, sorry, the villain in the fourth movie. Uh, yeah, just so you guys know, a little interesting fact: his name's Mac, and you, he's actually Sonny Chiba's son. Um, oh shit! Yeah. <laughs> Fucks with Sonny Chiba. Uh, rest in peace, Sonny Chiba. Uh, yeah, oh, shit. dopeness all yeah. around. Yeah, it's great movie, great adventure. Uh, if you are looking for some, some good, not set in modern day, but modern filmed action set pieces, they uh, they go all out there in Kenshin. Yeah, I don't want to come on to your podcast and plug my podcast, no, but no, if people it. if people are interested, we had a couple months ago. Uh, Kenji Tanagaki, who is the action designer and coordinator of the Ruani Kenshin movies, as well as Don, he's Donnie Yen's primary action designer. Uh, he came on and talked to us for a few hours, and we definitely spent a lot of time talking about Ruani Kenshin. So, uh, watch these movies and then check that episode out because it's it's very very entertaining and very enlightening. So, right on, right on. yeah, I love I love these movies. I I I can't sing the praises of these movies highly enough. I I think they're I consider that original trilogy to be it, it, it's going to sound like hyperbole, but I, I I'm being dead serious. I consider that original trilogy to be on par with Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Of how good it is. Um, the, the two Netflix, the two belated Netflix sequels, I think the, the fourth one, which is known as the final is also stands tall with those. The beginning, which is the fifth one is actually a prequel and it's it's not as good. It's worth watching, but it's it's not as as good as the rest of the series. But um, yeah, the series is insanely good, insanely and, good. And Daryl, you said that you you bought them. Did you get them from like Crunchyroll or where did you pick them up? Oh, uh, I feel like I think I just got them on Amazon, man. Funimation oh, okay. put them out on Blu-ray. Um, yeah. They put the first three out on Blu-ray. The two, the later two are Netflix exclusives in the US. So they're streaming only at this point, unfortunately. Yeah, I think uh I think the Blu-rays come with sub and dub. 
Um, so you have your preference there for, for anyone out there. If you can't get past that, uh, what did Bong Joon-ho call it? The one-inch barrier mm-hmm. there of subtitles. If you can't get past that, I do believe they have a dub version for you as well. And that was my fear is that that's what I was getting. And it came out as the subs. And I was like, yes, everything is right in the world right now. Okay, real quick. I know, I know, Mike, you got one more movie and then we are done with the episode. But I got to tell you all this because I always think it's funny as shit. If you've never done this, put on the dub, but keep the subs on. <laughs> yeah, you're getting two totally different stories sometimes. It, I, I was, I'm, I put on the most recent episode of Neon Genesis as I was doing show prep and this, that, and the other. And I've got it on the English so I can listen, but I've also got the sub on so I can look over. And I found myself just being like, Okay, in English, that was way kinder than what the dub was. (laughs) Yeah, it really makes you realize how much you miss with a dub if you Mm -hmm. do that. Um, You know, you realize how much context and stuff like that you you miss on a dub. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, watch, and, and I say that knowing full well, some people will watch, will prefer English language with subtitles no matter what they're watching. Some people like to watch stuff in the, in the native language. Um, Watch it however you're happy with. But if you haven't done it where you watch it in the native, where you watch it in the English language with also the translations, <laughs> it's wild. wild. I did that with Demon Slayer and I was like, what the, what the fuck am I watching? Because like, <laughs> very different. Anyway, anyway, so your last film, sir. So I, uh, I wanted to pick something that was recent uh, and something that highlighted a, up and coming unique country because that's one of my favorite things about martial arts movies is when something like Thai, like Thailand goes off with Tony Jaw or yeah. you know or Korea goes off with uh, Ryu Sung Won you know you get you get these countries going off on their martial arts movies and uh I also wanted to go with one that was going to challenge people's conceptions of what a martial arts movie could be particularly in terms of gore and blood and outright old ultra violence okay. uh so i have to recommend uh timo Gigantos the night comes for us which oh. is one of the most blistering balls to the wall absolute insane martial arts movies that has ever been made it also highlights you guys you know you mentioned the raid highlights uh eco uh silat which is a unique martial arts unique to indonesia mm-hmm. i always love anytime i see a martial art that i'm not that familiar with uh and this is just this is a mind melter of a movie this this movie will absolutely blow you away it starts at 11 and it goes up from there uh <laughs> and, and that's that's timo's way and i love it but this is his masterpiece this movie is incredible Agreed. Agreed. Uh, he 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 both excited and destroyed the internet with one tweet when he recently had shared a photo with Joe Taslam going chapter two, and all of us were like, "Oh, we're finally getting." He was like, "No, no, no. The two of us are just working on. We're looking for another project to work on together." Oh, <laughs> <laughs> this movie is the reason. If I ever see Joe Tazlin walking down the street, I am crossing the street immediately. <laughs> I tweeted out a couple of weeks ago, um, like, if Joe Tazlin pops up on screen, someone's dead within five minutes. That's just how these things work. Yep. Uh, not quite in Warrior, the TV show. He's kind of actually chill in that until he wasn't in this last season. But yeah. I mean, he's still uh, beating the shit out of everybody. Still, still he, he, he's not as eager. Like, like, he is here and the night comes for us. But yeah, amazing movie this is. This was a challenge from you, Doug. For me, it is. Oh, 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 I challenged you to watch it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I will yep. say that it was probably a challenge for me in the sense of I normally don't do gore. Uh, um, it is... It is hard for me uh, physically to watch certain types of violence. It is really weird. The con the context of the fight will determine on if it physically hurts me and makes me sick or if I'm like, fuck, yeah, it is so weird where that context of the fight and everything in the night comes for us. It's I don't think the violence in it is intended for you to be like, fuck, yeah, it's supposed to make you uncomfortable because of how realistic a lot of it is staged the 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 blocking 
the way that uh, characters are interacting with each other, with their fighting styles, the way that everything feels literally life or death in the way that things play out. Uh, this is not a expendables type of let's rock and roll. This is uh, not everyone is going to make it. When no. you're reading the credits, not everyone's going to make it by the end no. of this movie. No, and that's that's Timo. That's Timo in general. If you've seen any of his other movies like Killers or Headshot or even May the Devil Take You, you know, he's he's a pretty punishing filmmaker. Uh, but there's also a, an air of fun about mm-hmm. him kind of by like he's like a madman. He's got a very Sam Raimi-esque. Uh, and again, for those Listening, if you're interested, we had Timo on the show, too. So we spent a couple hours talking to Timo. So you can go go listen to that. Nice. Uh, you know, he's he's got a very mischievous little twinkle to him that uh, that makes him a lot of fun. and makes his movies a lot of fun. So but this one, you're right, Doug. This is I mean, this is not a movie for everybody. But uh, I, I think if you can if you can go with it. Uh, you're going to see a truly spectacular martial arts movie. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not a movie made for everyone because it was made specifically for me. <laughs> I, love, I love this movie. I think oh, the so uh, best review on Letterboxd of this movie, I thought the raid of Benjamin and Fury would have prepared me for this movie. Nope. And that is a <laughs> quote from Douglas Davis. Uh, yeah, good good call on that final one. man. Uh, it- Doug, you want to wrap this bad boy up? Uh, first of all, just to say that it still bums me out that there's no legit legal, I shouldn't say legitimate legal physical edition of The Night Comes for Us, and that I love every time someone says, why isn't there a memorable Netflix original? Almost like every every member of action <laughs> social media goes, motherfucker, The Night Comes for Us. Yep. Because that is one of several Netflix originals that are that are still talked about, still discussed, and still appreciated. Even if you only watch it once, like in my case. But I would still love to to revisit it at some point, um, just because of how fucking good it is. So anyway, I just want to thank you, Mike, for coming to join us for this. Yeah, we this will, was a blast. Thank you th- so much. We, we are delighted to hear you say that. We will absolutely be including uh, your information as far as action for everybody when we post this uh, so that people will be able to find you. But uh, in addition to action for everyone, if there's anything else you want to plug or any other place we can find you or things that you recommend, go for it. Good, sir. Yeah, I mean, you can find the show at Linktree slash A4E podcast. I am stepping down my Twitter presence, but I am on Blue Sky, so you can find me there. And then the other thing I will say is we do have an A4E Discord. Uh, it's 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 an open Discord, so but we're you still have to ask us for an invite, but we're letting everybody in. So just reach out to to me through the the A4E Twitter, which is A4E podcast on Twitter. I'm not calling it X. I will never call it X. Um, <laughs> good man. Reach out to me through that and I'll happily hook you up with an invite. Uh, it's a good group of people over there. We just, we sit and shoot the shit about action movies. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a fun time. So that's, those are the best places to find me. What a way to live. Just shooting shit about action movies. What a way to live. It, it's, it's as though just talking about cinema and being able to appreciate the fact that we can talk about art in this way. It's, it's, just it's <laughs> it's the best thing ever we are it, lucky we are lucky that we have this stuff to talk about the thing that i've been surprised about with our discord is i'm so battle shy i'm so like traumatized by twitter that mm-hmm. like i'm stunned that like somebody can like express an opinion about a movie in the discord and like he won't get like they won't get like 25 randos in their mentions, you know, telling them to kill themselves. Yeah. Like it, it's a very, very different world uh, that I'm I'm not I I'm not used to again. Like I used to be used to that, but I'm not I'm not used to it right now. It's a it's a good feeling when it can just be about the art. Yep. When it can be about, hey. You like this thing. Well, I like this other thing. And we can both like our things and coexist together. It's not pie. We can we can all <laughs> like our stuff and it doesn't take away from anybody else. So yeah. um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time. This ran a little longer than I think we intended. Uh, but I so very, very much appreciate it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> 
No problem. I have that. I have that effect when I'm on podcasts because I don't <laughs> shut up. So I apologize. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. No. Oh, no. Uh, as Daryl will attest, um, I hardly ever shut up. So he runs it. We also often run late just because I'm like, but one more thing, which is why so many of our episodes just end 